Psalm 56, I've entitled, Placing Each of My Tears into Your Bottle, based on a phrase in verse 9 of Psalm 56. I have a fascination with ancient objects as an opportunity to hold in my hand a sense of the history of the past. This is an oil lamp from the revolt against the Romans during the time of Bar Kokhba, second century of the Common Era. This jar is of a few hundred years before, during the time just after the revolt against the Greeks, the Hasmonean period. This object is found, was found, in an ancient Jewish grave. Such vessels are identified later by some archaeologists as tear catchers. Vessels that were placed in Greek and Roman tombs as a holder of tears, and the more tears, the more love, the more mourning of the loss of a loved one. The image of tear catchers, of bottles to hold tears, would gain popularity at different points. And in Victorian England in the 19th century, such bottles called lacrimatory bottles, lacrima from the Latin for tears, were very popular. Today, those bottles look a lot like a perfume bottle. But in the image of Victoria, England, these as vessels for tears was linked to this psalm. Psalm 56, verse 9. My wanderings you have counted, placing each of my tears into your bottle. Modern scholars, chemists who've examined these bottles widely found in Greco-Roman tombs say that what is found as sediment is usually fragrant oils, essences, which makes sense in terms of wanting to offset the smells of the tomb. And yet, the idea of tear catchers, of bottles in which you place tears, is contained in Harry Potter, and in other literature through the days, like the Sisterhood of the Yo-Yo, Ma, has an image of a lacrimatory bottle. Well, we'll return to how verse 9 and the image of collecting tears in a bottle has a central place in this particular psalm. But first, let me share the psalm with you. Psalm 56, for the, for the conductor, upon Yonat El Yonat Elim Rechokim of David, a michtam, when the Philistines grabbed him in Gath. Be gracious to me, God, for a person would swallow me up all day like a fighter oppresses me. My watchers yearn to swallow me up all day long, for many fight against me, Most High. By day afraid am I, in you I will put my trust. In God I will praise God's word. In God do I trust. I will not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long my affairs they trouble. Upon me are all their thoughts for evil. They gather together, they hide themselves. My steps they mark as they wait for my spirit. On account of iniquity, cast them out. In rage, bring down the peoples, God. My wanderings you have counted, placing each of my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your account book? Then my enemies will turn back on the day that I call. This I have known, that God is for me. In God, I will praise his word. In Adonai, I will praise his word. In God, do I trust. I will not be afraid. 
What can a person do to me? Upon me, God, are your vows. I will bring thanks offerings to you, for you have saved my spirit from death, surely have delivered my feet from stumbling, so that I may walk before God in the light of love, in the light of life. Mm. I'll come back to that slip of light of love at the end. But let's start again from the beginning. This phrase for the conductor upon Jonath Elam Rechokim is obscure. It's not clear what kind of instrument that is. There are many named instruments that begin psalms, the word psalm meaning a song. Literally, it means a dove who is mute at a distance. The important Spanish medieval poet Yehuda Halevi will use this phrase as a silenced dove in wandering, Yonat Elim Rechokim, to refer to the people of Israel. And we saw in Psalm 55, just before this psalm, the image of the psalmist saying, if I could only be like a dove taking flight. And so here, almost as a next phase, as a link to Psalm 55, is the image of a mute dove at a distance. Meiri, an important commentator in Europe in the 13th century, will say that the sound of this instrument is like a dove. It's a cooing sound. But again, the term is obscure, as is the term michtav, which in more contemporary Hebrew will mean an aphorism, but it's not clear what it means in this biblical context. Verse 2, Chaneni Elohim, be gracious to me. That's a refrain we have seen in Psalms. The word chen means kindness, but it's a act of giving, of generosity, expecting nothing in return. It's an undeserved kindness. Chaneni, be kind to me, undeservedly may I be before you, God. For a person would swallow me up, kol hayom, all the day. Long a fighter oppresses me. This word kol hayom, I'll circle, and that'll reappear in verse 3, verse 4, and verse 6. There's the sense of an unrelenting, all day long, being oppressed. Verse 3, my watchers yearn to swallow me up all day long, for many fight against me, most high. As if, again, God, you have the perspective to see. You are marom, above, from a point of view that allows you to see what transpires in my life. Yom, by day, Iraani, I am afraid. Elecha eftach, I will put in you my trust. And that image of fear and not fearing is a sense of what the psalmist is feeling, a vacillating in fear. Verse 5, in God I will praise God's word. In God do I trust. I will not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? So again, I fear, but I will not be afraid. Why? Because in God do I trust. In contrast to my enemies who lack fear of God, who don't feel accountable. That's a recurring theme. I do trust in God. I, knew you, I know you do watch all of what we do all day long. My affairs, they trouble, verse 6, upon me are all their thoughts for evil. They gather together 
they hide themselves. My steps they mark as they wait for my spirit. My spirit can mean nafshi as they wait for my life, to take my life. And the emphasis of my steps they mark will now emerge the image of my feet, my path, my ability to move forward. Verse 8, on account of iniquity, cast them out. In rage, bring down the peoples, God. Bring them down can both mean bring them down to mean to defeat. But as we also see in Psalms, it can bring them down into the grave because of their iniquity. And now you can see through verses 2 to 8, the feeling of endangerment of the psalmist, a fear and a vacillating to, I will not fear, I will trust in you. And now verse 9, the transition. My wanderings you have counted, placing each of my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your account book? But before I focus and unpack verse 9. Let me start from the beginning again. When the Philistines grabbed him in Goth, that's a reference to a story in David's life, but the commentators will have two different points of contact of David and the Philistines. In the first book of Samuel, chapter 21, Verses 11 and 16 are a description of the king of Achish in Gath, this place, before whom David is brought and who David will feign madness to be dismissed by the king and to escape. That's also recounted as the introduction of Psalm 34. Many of the medieval commentators, however, We'll focus on a different chapter 21, namely the second book of Samuel, chapter 21, verse 16, where the Philistine, Goliath's brother, Yishbi, is mentioned by name, who seeks to capture David. And so it's not clear, as is the nature of Psalms, whether this is the moment of a young David's life during the time of King Achish or the time of Yishbi, an older King David endangered by the Philistines. But verses 2 to 8 have this danger. And now verse 9. No di safarta ata, my wanderings you have counted. Wanderings evokes the image of the curse of Cain, where he is told that he will be a no-dead, a wanderer. And you can feel the psalmist having the sense of being a marked person who is ostracized, who is endangered by everyone he passes, wandering throughout his life, whether at the beginning or at the end. Safarta ata, you have counted back to steps being watched in verse 7 by David's enemies. Here it is God who is counting David's steps, David's wanderings. And now that image, dim ati bin odecha, vin odecha, you have placed my tears in a bottle. And the bottle, ne'odecha, sounds like a wordplay on nodi, wandering, wandering in your bottle, my tears. Tears is actually in the singular, as if to say that each of my tears you have placed in your bottle a sense of God's compassion and care. Almighty God focusing on one person, Cain, that quality of God's kindness, 
loving kindness. Halo bisferatecha. Are they not in your account book? Now, the word sifarta and sifratecha can either be understood as counting or recounting. We say that in English too, you can recount a tale, you can retell a tale. So the Hebrew word can be count or to tell. My wanderings you have told, you have marked. Are they not in your book? The idea of God having a book appears in the story of Moses, where Moses says to God, don't wipe out this people as you, as you are threatening to do after the golden calf. If it is such, wipe me out from your book, as if God has a book into which God records. You get that same image, the prophet Malachi 3.16, Sefer Zichron, your book of remembrance. And you get it in other places in Psalms. Psalm 69 makes reference to a book of life. Psalm 139. Um, that reference in Exodus was 32, 32. The notion that God records. But in this case, what's distinctive is the image of the tear catcher. It's a turning point, as if by the image that God is aware of my tears, God is concerned for me. And with that feeling of concern, I now have hope. And so a transition. Then my enemy, enemies will turn back on the day that I call. This I have known, that God is for me. In God, I will praise his word. In Adonai, I will praise his word. And now repeating verse 5. In God do I trust. I will not be afraid. What can a person do to me? But as verse 5 gets repeated in verse 12, there's a sense of it being with a different tone. Now a newfound tone of confidence for the tear catcher the God of compassion I now am aware of is before me. Verse 13, upon me, God, are your vows. I will bring thanks offerings to you. As if the vows that David has made have not yet been fulfilled, but there is the promise and hope of being able to bring offerings yet again so that I won't be on the run I will be in a place of security, in a place even of your temple. And the last line, For you have saved my spirit from death, surely have delivered my feet from stumbling, so that I may walk before God in the light of life. Here again, returning to the image of feet, in which God has protected from stumbling, so that I may walk. The image that plays out of being the wanderer on the run, who is now with God's care, able to move forth steadfastly at a walk before God in the light of love. I had that verbal slip of saying, and when I read it in the light of love, and indeed, what is this closing image, Bo'or Hachayim, in the light of either the living or life? Some say it's to say, I am now alive. So I walk among the other living. Hachayim could be, because it's in the plural, those who are living. I prefer translating it, as many do, as in the light of life. You get that image Job 33.30, to bring him back from the pit, shachat, that he may bask in the light of love, be'or hachayim, so that the opposite of darkness is the light of life, the light of God, and if you will, 
the light of love. And that's what he ultimately is seeking, that he, rather than being hiding, rather than being on the move, will be able to walk steadfastly before God in the light of life. Classic commentators, beginning with the early rabbis, see that, and Rabbi David Kimchi, Spain, 12th and 13th century, as the Garden of Eden, as the ultimate trajectory. May I walk before God in the Garden of Eden. Sforno, Italy, 15th and 16th century, says it's the longer trajectory to the world to come. Art Scroll will say in its come, Terry, it's the ultimate goal. To pull together Psalm 56, many of the motifs are the motifs we have seen. David, whether as a young man or as an older man, with the ambiguity of when the Philistines grabbed him, is feeling endangered and vacillating between fear for his life, of a sense of an enemy who's counting his steps, trying to find him, looking for his steps, and the sense that God will give David the ability to walk without stumbling, will be safe, will vanquish his enemies. And so artfully done, the contrast between verse 4 and 5, in God do I trust, and 11 and 12, in God do I trust, I will not be afraid. What can a person do to me with the transition of the tear catcher? That if God catches his tears, places them into a bottle, writes them into God's book, then he is assured of God's ever present hayom, each day, each moment, personal concern for his tears. Rabbi Martin Cohen asks, what is he crying for? On the surface, he's crying because he's afraid. But he could also be crying, Rabbi Cohen says, out of sadness for God, that there is this world of war, of danger, that it's not the intended world of God. And he asks, as we read this psalm, what is it that we shed tears for? Can we indeed empathize and have tears for God? For me, this is a psalm about tear catchers, both because I love the physical imagery, but more the image that God is a God of personal empathy. Each tear, each moment of our yearnings or fear are observed and cared for by God.